When we were in North Bay, we heard about a company called Burr Oak Resources, and we definitely wanted to chat with the owner, Lance, who is a leader in renewable energy in his area. Uh, hello, my name is Lance Johnson, um, and this is our company, Burr Oak Resources. We're based here in uh, lovely northern Ontario, North Bay, Ontario specifically. Uh, our company specializes in, I guess to sum it up, uh, generating power from nature. We uh, generate mostly from the sun, but we also generate power from running water and uh, wind. My background, personally, is uh, somewhat technical, I guess, in, in the mining field and civil engineering. Um, but after a period of time in that industry, I kind of needed a change. So uh, in looking at the choices and looking at the future, um, renewable energy seemed the obvious choice for me uh, to make a difference. So what does Burr Oak Resources do? We do a number of things. We sell retail products directly to people wanting to live off grid, wanting to reduce their environmental footprint, become a little more energy efficient and just have that do-it-yourself attitude. Uh, so the retail end of it caters to that. Our main motto is to try and do for the customer uh, what's the best in their long-term interest. It's not just about uh, selling and installing systems, but it's it's about designing solutions that work. I had the experience of going in and looking at a lot of uh, systems that were you know poorly designed, poorly installed, and people had very disappointing uh, experiences with that and I thought you know that's uh, not how it should be really. We wanted to know what the worst result was from a poor installation that Lance had seen. Well I've seen worse than fall apart. I've, there's <laughs> one. <laughs> we found a blade like seven, eight hundred feet in the bush sticking into the ground like a harpoon. Oh gosh. Thankfully it went, you know, away from the house. So what does Baroque do to properly install a system? Uh, living off grid is, is really about the numbers. It's about doing a proper assessment of a site, a proper assessment of, of the energy needed and when it's needed, during the day, during the night, what month of the year and uh, looking at the site and seeing what do you need to harvest that energy, what do you need to store that energy, and what do you need to recapture that energy out of storage. It's all um, simply designing things according to the formulas. Uh, we have the proper equipment to look at sites and assess them for their orientation, their shading, and a number of different things so that we can very uh, quantitatively uh, look at a site and say, this is what we need to satisfy the energy needs for this customer. A solar system that's going to squeak you through the winter months or your critical months might be six or even ten times too big in the summer. So it then makes sense to start looking at a, a secondary source of power. Uh, so then we'll look at doing a, a wind turbine then uh, to kind of help and then we can cut down on the oversizing of the solar for the summer. And what happens is your solar energy is like this in the summer and then it's going down in the winter and then wind is kind of the opposite. It's higher in the winter and lower in the summer. So the two work out to a more consistent uh, supply of power year round. So it's actually quite easy to integrate multiple sources into an off-grid system because think of your battery bank like a barrel of water and you're just, you, you could have five people dumping water in with cups, it doesn't really matter, it's just going to fill the barrel. And if those five people are dumping water in faster than you're taking it out, well, it's going to fill up. And if they're not, it's going to be draining even though you're putting, uh, putting water in. So your battery, so your storage of energy, it can kind of equate it to just a you know, storage device like water. Um, so how, how a typical wind turbine works, um, almost all of them are three-phase AC power. So they actually generate a, an AC uh, three-phase, so a three-wire type of voltage. But we rectify that power into DC power so that we can control it with uh, charge controllers. Uh, some of the more top-end charge controllers nowadays actually have a wind mode and a solar mode and a hydro mode. So you can use the same device to actually harvest energy and control, put it into your batteries in a controlled fashion. We asked Lance to explain microhydro systems. Another alternative is uh, having a microhydro source, um, having a 
basically water running from one elevation to another elevation. If you have an off-grid, a chance, sorry, to live off-grid with that type of power source, you're laughing. That's just a whole different story and a whole different off-grid experience because you now have a round-the-clock dependable power source. Basically how that works is very much uh, identical to a wind turbine. It's just a little alternator that generates three-phase power. We rectify it into DC power and then we put it through a charge controller uh, into um, your batteries. Um, there's a couple of different ways we can do that. Typically we have a, a low head, higher flow type, uh, which as the name implies, it's, it, it's, you don't have a big elevation change, so we're depending more on flow and less on pressure uh, to generate power. You can start generating power at about, um, I don't know, about three quarters of a meter of head uh, with, a, with a low head turbine. Um, it's basically just a propeller on the end of an alternator and you funnel water down a tube. Then the, the higher head type usually has like a Peltor turbine or something in it, which is uh, just kind of a special turbine that uses a water jet directed onto it, so a pressurized spray of water. Um, and that pressurized spray is developed by capturing uh, water from this elevation in a pipe, it develops more pressure as you have more elevation chains and that pressure as it's escaping the nozzle turns the turbine. Sorry, and the one thing I forgot to mention before about wind or uh, microhydro is you, you have to have a thing called a dump load or you have to be able to control that turbine because if your batteries become full, you have to keep that thing loaded up so it doesn't overspeed and throw the blades or something or damage itself. So. That's the one other component is usually a dump load. Some wind turbines have a thing called a, an auto furling device. So when they're unloaded by the charger because they've charged the batteries, they've done their job. If it's still windy, they'll furl themselves out of the wind so that they're not turning as fast. Um, so yeah, micro hydro is the same thing. You actually, if you can't use all the power you have, you have to dump it somewhere. So you need a dump load, which is usually just resistors that heat the air or something, but if you want to get creative, it could be a resistor in a hot water tank that's going to heat, hot, heat water for you. Burrow also deals with TEGS, thermoelectric generators. So thermoelectric generation um, is a process, I guess, most electrically similar actually to a, to a cell in a PV module. So what happens is um, when heat energy is moving through a thermoelectric generator, it uh, basically it needs a cold side and a hot side and what that does is that forces electrons to move through it in one way and it generates an electrical current. They can be uh, a useful way to kind of recapture some extra energy uh, off of a wood stove or something if you're heating in the winter. Uh, so tags are something I think uh, as their efficiency increases I can see the applications being pretty huge. We wondered why Burr Oak Resources didn't offer geothermal installations. Uh, geothermal is something where we live well north of a line where you're, the, the importance of how geothermal works, if, you know, for people that don't understand, is it? it's a system that runs in two directions. It moves heat into your house for part of the year and out of your house for the other part of the year. And what I mean by north of a line where it balances is that if you're trying to pull more heat out of the ground than you ever replenish back into the ground, you're eventually going to run out of heat in the ground. And so what happens is you end up with permafrost. And here, um, improper siting has been the cause of many failed installations. Living off grid, you know, it's, it's a choice. It's not necessarily going to save you money over being connected to the grid. Some, for some people it's about the freedom. Um, but the real hard economics of it are that the batteries, our battery technology today is still, it needs to be replaced periodically. So even your, your real top end um, you know, lead acid batteries, you're going to get 10 to 13 years out of them if you really take care of them. And then after that, uh, they just kind of die from a process called sulfation, and it's just going to happen. However, uh, some real good technology that's really advancing uh, quickly because of the electric car market is lithium ion. We've been doing lithium ion battery banks now for about five years. Uh, with great success. So when you look at uh, lithium ion technology, there's lithium ion battery cells out there now that are, you know, reportedly been run for up to 10,000 cycles 
uh, on test banks without losing really any significant amount of storage. Um, but here's the key difference. A lead acid battery, even a deep cycle battery, actually doesn't like to be discharged. <laughs> that sounds crazy, but that's the truth. So if you take a high quality battery that's rated at 5,000 cycles, but you discharge it down till it's almost dead each time instead of only the 20% that they run the test at. So in other words, think of it like having your vehicle and every time you get down to three quarters of a tank, you gotta refill it again. That's what a lead acid battery is like. You can't use the rest of the tank. <laughs> if you do, uh, then you're gonna take that 5,000 cycle battery and drop it down to about 1,200. If you don't want to deal with batteries for storage, then look into net metering. You know, as our industry is moving forward, we're, we, we've passed a point where your cost to generate energy is, is lower than your cost to buy it from the grid. So uh, we've passed parity in, in that sense. That's grid parity is a term that's used to express the cost of generation versus the cost of just buying it from the grid. Uh, so what does that mean exactly? That means, well, you can install a system and using something called net metering, you can generate your own power um, cheaper than you can buy it. If you're set up with net metering, your system only needs to be big enough to generate your annual average energy consumption. So that's a huge difference. Remember we talked about living off-grid, you have to build your system to survive that worst week. <laughs> um, now it doesn't matter what the worst week is, it just matters that on a, in a year, uh, because your, your net metering account is typically a rolling 12-month window of storage and drawdown. And so what that means is that typically the typical person, sorry, in the summer will be building credits in their uh, net meter account. So in other words, they'll be putting more power into the grid than they're actually using. And then during the winter months, you'll be drawing those credits down. So you're going to be drawing out more credit and more energy from the grid than you're putting into it in the winter. But you have that reserve of power now that you've built up from the summer. And there is no other way you can store power from the summer to the winter. It's just not possible with any other technology currently. Nuclear energy is, you know, they thought it was a beautiful thing. But the problem with it is that it's, it's a baseline load. It can't fluctuate. It can't be turned up and down. Uh, as the real demands change day to night. So that's a real problem we have to deal with here in Ontario. So believe it or not, um, we have too much power at night. <laughs> we actually have to pay people to take it away. That's crazy, yeah. <laughs> but we do. And the people that take it away, they do so gladly because like our neighbors in Quebec and New York State, they have hydroelectric generation. So they just turn the tap down a bit they get paid to take our power at night and they just save it in the form of water in their reservoir that they didn't take out. Then they sell power back to us during the day. So with the new technology, like for example, the smart grid installation we did at Science North, um, that system, yes, it, it's improving the, actually improving the power in the grid uh, by doing active power factor correction. Um, power factor is just a measure when power isn't pure power because your voltage and your current aren't at, on exactly the same waveform. So in other words, one's leading or lagging the other. So you can measure them both, but they're not giving you, they're not delivering true power when your power factor is not one or unity. The installation we did in Sudbury, I, I believe it's the first one of its kind in Ontario um, in that it incorporates both uh, lithium-ion battery storage technology <coughs> and solar technology that are both uh, smart grid integrated so they can both be used to do a few things power factor correction from both the battery based inverters and from the solar system uh, but also the battery based system can be used to shed a peak load to help the grid uh, get through those times when it just almost can't make mm -hmm. uh, you know make it through because we don't have enough generation to meet peak and uh, we come a lot closer to that than the average person realizes, I think, on a daily basis. Well, uh, my name is Lance Johnson from Burr Oak Resources. Uh, you can find us on the web at burroaksolar.ca uh, or at 160 Pinewood Park Drive here in beautiful North Bay in northern Ontario, Canada.